When I'm out of the house, whether that be at work or getting together with friends, game development is always in the back of my mind. And there are a few times during the game development process where I feel I'd rather be doing anything else. Yet, progress has been slow and methodical, and has allowed me to learn a lot, not only about game development, but about productivity in general. Now, this project has been in the works since September of 2023, meaning that I've been working on my game for over... Okay, so I'm obligated to tell you that this video is a sequel to a video I posted over half a year ago. That video covers my first six months of development on the project. This video covers months seven through 12. Okay, thanks. Real quick, I'll catch everyone up on what I was doing last in the project. In month six, I was working on overall weapon handling features like bullet trajectory, weapon sway, and firing recoil. The two things you could do as the player in this early build was walk around and shoot barrels. Not exactly feature dense yet, after a short break to work on my first devlog, I was right back to work on the game. The first week of month 7 was a very animation-oriented week. I added the ability to aim down sights with every weapon in the game thus far. I also implemented procedural sprint animations for the player character. Wait, what's, what's what the procedural hell is this guy mean? talking about? Let me explain. You've probably heard this word a lot if you've been in the game dev scene for any amount of time. Procedural just means that the software, or game, is creating something that uses a set of rules slash an algorithm. Games like Minecraft and No Man's Sky utilize procedurally generated worlds so that players can explore indefinitely. My game has procedural animations, meaning that the computer animates the character based on the set of rules that I made. Although the quality of these procedural elements might not be as impressive as their handcrafted counterparts, this saves developers, i.e. me, a lot of time. Back to week 25, I improved the transitions between animations with the use of procedural animations. Now, animations like sprinting and reloading can be played at the same time, which is cool. In week 26, I continued working on animation improvements. The transitions and weapon swapping were improved. I made the decision to swap the hand animated weapon swapping animation to procedural animation. Like I said, the procedural animations don't look as good, but this solution will save me hours of time when adding new weapons. I also improved the recoil on weapons so it doesn't look as robotic. The heads up display, or HUD for short, was also tweaked to be more readable. This won't be the final iteration for the ammo counter, but it does the job for the time being. Now that I had decided which animations were going to be hand animated and which were going to be procedural, I can now work on other weapons. To start, I opened Blender and began work on my AKM animations. I was able to build the character rig and complete all of the firing animations fairly quickly. The rest of my time this week was spent blocking out the weapon posing for the tactical reload animation. I spent all of my time on week 29 finishing up the tactical reload animation for the AKM. Week 30, I spent importing the AKM animations into the game. I also changed the animation code to allow the reload animations of weapons to overwrite the sprinting animation. This means that characters won't have a unique sprint reloading animation, but I think that having the reload overwrite the sprinting animation communicates better when the reload is happening and when it's done. I spent all of week 31 working on the combat reload animation for the AKM. I got most of it done, but the hand posing still needed some work. Week 32 was a busy one. I finished the combat reload animation for the AKM and quickly imported it into Godot. I also implemented the M16A4 as a usable weapon. Usable with an asterisk. The weapon currently only uses procedural animations, and game balance-wise is just an AKM that deals less damage. But it's usable, and that's what I need. Because if you have a two-weapon inventory system like my game does, you need at least three weapons to swap between. So now my game has a basic interaction system and weapon pickups. In week 33, I increased the repertoire of interactables by adding ammo pickups to the game. Each weapon has its own box of ammo that resupplies the player when interacted with. When interacting with these, you only take as much as your character can hold, and the rest is left in the box. But having to account for so many different ammo types would be ridiculous in a normal match. For simplicity's sake, I also added an ammo crate that resupplies the ammo for all of your weapons when interacted with. This is the ammo pickup that you'll probably see the most often in the final game. Also, to distinguish this cube from the plethora of other cubes in this unfinished game, I gave it a handsome texture. And with this, the weapon economy has been mostly figured out. With these systems in place, players can change weapons and resupply ammo at will, provided that they can find them. In week 34, I gave the player a health variable. And you might be asking yourself, why would I add a health variable to the player if there's nothing that could damage them? By week 35, these little characters were able to locate and shoot the player within a certain radius of themselves. If the player gets hit, they take damage and lose health. If their health goes below zero, the player dies. Okay, this is bare bones, but it's good enough for the time being. But what are you supposed to do when you die? Just close the game? Uninstall? It was time to add a few menus to the game. That being a pause menu and a main menu. 
there are going to be a lot of grayed out options right now, okay? Just don't worry about it. From the pause menu, you can exit the game or navigate to the main menu. This takes you to a new scene with a bunch of options that have yet to be added to the game. Clicking single player and then instant action will load you into the test level. This week was actually really exciting because I could see this project turning more and more into an actual game. In the last week of month 9, I built a big roadmap for the game. All of the features included on the roadmap were not final, but it was about time I organized all of my ideas for the game in a more succinct way. I also began learning how to make textures this week. I didn't need to do this right then, but I really felt like learning the texturing process. I plan on making all of my textures low resolution. The goal is for the game to have a similar vibe to... In week 37, I finished the materials for the G17. I ended up having to redo a lot of the work, since I didn't know that you had to save the texture files separately from the blend files. In other news, I wanted to test out features with the NPCs I've been working on, and decided that I would need a larger area to work with. That means it's time to make a new level, or map. I decided to build this new map around the core theme of a paintball field, and took inspiration from paintball fields I've been to in the past. Some other changes from this week include updating my game engine from Godot 4.2.1 to Godot 4.3, and transitioning from the default physics engine to the Jolt physics engine. I made the switch because the player character got easily stuck on most of the collision objects I was making for my new map. With the Jolt physics engine, this simply doesn't happen anymore. In week 38, I made a few models for my upcoming map, including some shipping containers, what I have dubbed an objective tile, some sandbag variants, a jersey barrier, and some pesco-looking military walls, inspired by their inclusion in one of my favorite games, Squad. These props were then used to build up some of the major landmarks of the new map. At this point, the map is about 40% done. The last thing I did this week was modify player movement, so that the player walks slower when aiming down sights. In week 39, I finished the gray boxing stage of my paintball map, and added collision to all of the props. I also put in a lot of work into the player's health variable. I updated the health HUD so that it shows at a progress bar, and now the player's health regenerates over time. The exact rate of regeneration and regeneration delay are still to be balanced and tweaked, but it's functional for now. The main menu has seen an addition of features, including an update to the instant action menu. Players can now choose between two maps and two game modes, and change the amount of NPCs each team gets. I want my game to have a lot of options for the player to customize their experience, something akin to Halo Reach's custom games. Behind the scenes this week, I worked on the match director and zone objectives. Zone objectives will be important in the domination game mode I'm working on. They're the thingies you have to stand in to capture, which then passively earns points. The match director will act above individual levels, and will handle all of the major logic for matches, like spawning in NPCs, match settings, the game mode and map chosen, etc. To begin the final week of month 10, I improved the fluidity and look of the main menu's user interface. Each map now has a preview image, and game modes have many descriptions, all with the intention of better informing the player. I also worked on the match director this week. Hey, check out this cool bug I made. The match director's most important role is to load and unload major scenes. The major scenes in this example being the main menu and the two maps, paintball field and test level. The mistake I made was forgetting to clear the loaded scene before making a new one. So multiple scenes were being loaded at once, causing the levels to build over each other. Once I figured that out, I fixed it, and now the match director is functional. I say functional, but we're basically back to where we were without it, loading scenes. Also, it broke the pause menu, allowing the player to move and shoot and jump when they're not supposed to. Next month, I'll have to fix this and add the rest of the features to the match director. Okay, I scrapped the match director because I learned it made no sense. The match director was going to be a scene that the main menu would load into, taking variables from my instant action screen and building the level from them. This would have been complicated, as referencing to other scenes would get more messy and I would have to rework a lot of my infrastructure in the process. To be fair, I didn't know any better way to do it at the time. But this is week 41, okay? I'm a changed man. I don't make the same mistakes as week 39 me does. The way we're gonna do this now is by using an auto-loading script. An auto-loading script is a script that loads automatically in the background. So the idea is this. We have an auto-loading script that holds a bunch of variables like map chosen, mode chosen, number of NPCs per team, whatever basically. We then tell the main menu to modify those variables depending on what the player chooses in the menu. We then load in the map that was chosen. Then, each map will have the same boilerplate script that handles spawning, game modes, objectives, and stuff. I know it sounds like a redundant change to scrap the match director, but just trust me, the note hierarchy was going to be chaotic if I kept it the old way. 
and scrapping the match director made the pause menu work again, which is cool. Other than that, I worked on the world logic script that the maps need to not crash now. I also started writing the zone objective script, which became more complicated than I had anticipated. I was trying to write my code to account for an unlimited amount of teams being in the game, but that requires a lot of checks and balances that my dumbass couldn't figure out without it breaking. I think I'll just delete everything and retry, focusing only on one team versus one team logic. Sorry, but this means we won't be getting free-for-all domination anytime soon. But, with a smaller amount of teams to account for, completing the script for the zone objectives was a cinch. The objective tiles emit the color of the controlling team, so red, blue, and green, with white being the neutral color. When inside the area of an objective, text will appear on the top of the player's screen, displaying the current status of the objective that they are in. The color of the text also indicates ownership of the objective, similar to objective tiles. In addition to this conditional HUD element, players can access the scoreboard at any time by pressing the tab key. This toggleable visual shows game mode information, the scores for both teams, and the amount of points required to win the match. Improvements to the pause menu have been made this week, like the hiding of the heads-up display when paused, and background blur. And finally, the match can now end with winning and losing states, making this an actual game instead of just a tech demo. It's a boring game with no enemies right now, but it's a game. In order to streamline the development of future maps, I added new developer tools to visualize the area size of the objectives. Immediately, I realized that all the objectives on the map had the same area size, which was not intended, so I had to fix that bug. This tool is great because I can modify the areas in real time while in the game, which is much better than guess and checking like I initially did. The rest of the week I spent making spawn points for the player. You might be asking, doesn't the player already have a spawn point? I mean, you've been running around the map this whole video, right? Well, kinda. I've just been dropping the player in each map like I would an object or item. But the goal is to have a dynamic spawn system, which means writing code that allows the game to instantiate the player instead of just having them in the map by default. Instantiating being fancy talk for spawning something. Also, if I want to make this game multiplayer at some point, I'll want to account for a varying amount of players needing to spawn. So here's the progress I made this week. For now, the player is instantiated at a set coordinate on all maps. That being 0, 0. On opposite sides of the paintball map, there are almost identical box-looking buildings. And in week 44, they replaced the placeholder coordinates and became the spawn points of each team. Players will now randomly spawn somewhere in the box space upon the start of the game. Now that the spawn system is fully up and running, it was time to rework the players' death state and implement respawning. Here are the changes I made. First, players can no longer interact with the world upon death, meaning no movement, looking, or weapon mechanics. Secondly, the player's character body now disappears upon death. However, this feature is placeholder. I was going to implement the ragdolling of characters when they die, but making it work and look good is actually way more complicated than I initially thought. Also, when dead, the player will now no longer have influence on the zone objectives they were in. Lastly, I added some UI elements to be shown when the player dies, allowing them to respawn. Bug fixing! Basically, what's happening is that I forgot to code in the deletion of the player's old body after they respawn, which allows the player to respawn multiple times. You can't see your own body, or bodies in this case, so you just see your many copies of your arms flying everywhere. And finally, it was the last month of this sprint. At this point in the project, everything was set up to start fleshing out the bot combatants I started three months ago. So to begin, I'm going to teach them how to walk. First, I generated a navigation mesh for the paintball field map, which tells the bots where they can and can't go. Also, while reviewing the script I wrote for the bots' AI, I realized that every bot was programmed to exclusively kill the green team. I wrote this back when I was testing out bot combat months ago, and I just needed them to try to kill me, but now they need to kill other bots, and not just me. I rewrote the script to make it so that bots attack other teams and ignore their allies. In addition, I added basic colors to the bots, depending on which team they're on. I then applied this to the players' body and hands, but now players and bots on the same team look identical, so I gave the player characters a special hat to distinguish them. Another addition I made is that bots now have pathfinding, and I'll spare you the dull details, but it's really janky right now, and they get stuck on corners a lot. But hey, you gotta start somewhere. Right now, they're just programmed to walk to the center of the map, but I plan on adding more dynamic destinations in the near future. I borrowed some of the code from the player spawning system and applied it to the bots with a few tweaks. But with this many, they're really clogging up the doorways. I solved this by adding a push mechanic that moves the bots out of the way if you're close enough to them. It's kind of jank, but it fulfills its purpose, so I'm just gonna leave it as is for now. Okay, so these fuckers are still blocking the doorway. Collision privileges revolved. Just in the spawn areas, though. 
I also coded in personal space to the bots, so they'll give each other breathing room. Additionally, I gave the bots velocity, so that they slide a little before they stop moving. All of these combined has been enough to get them past the corners they've been stuck on for the past week. The side effect of adding these improvements is that now the bots do a dancing ritual in the spawn room at the start of every match. Player and bot health is now configurable, because I got tired of getting killed by the bots when trying to test their collision and pathfinding. In week 47, I made the dynamic destination system minimally functional. The bots will now go to a random objective at a random coordinate in the objective. I could have left it at that, but I wanted my bots to be more sophisticated. These bots are supposed to emulate the behaviors of real human players, whom typically play with some form of strategy in mind. Giving the bots goals and priorities would help them be more lifelike and less artificial. So, in week 46, I made a bunch of roles for the bots. These roles give each bot a specific match-wide mission to carry out. My roles are focused on high-priority objectives, which are objectives usually located near the center of the map or otherwise have some advantageous geographic distinction. Low roles are focused on low-priority objectives, like the ones spotting the corners of maps. Attackers are looking to capture objectives for their team, while defenders are looking to defend owned objectives from enemy attackers. Roamers are the unpredictable bots that will just be walking around the map looking for enemies. The game dishes out all of these roles evenly to the bots at the start of a match. Keep in mind that right now this only works to set an initial target destination for the bots, so once they get to where they're going, they will stay there until killed or the game ends. Speaking of killed, the bots can now respawn after dying, and I added Markiplier ammo boxes to each of the teams' bases. When playtesting my game, I found that I had trouble knowing where to go after capturing an objective, since there was no HUD indicator telling me which objectives were and weren't owned by my team. One of my goals for this game is to have as minimal HUD elements as possible, but I really can't overlook this one. So in week 48, I added objective statuses to the scoreboard. I also added the objectives as names to the respective objective tiles, so that players could distinguish them in a different way than just their nearby landmarks. I also tried improving the lighting on this map since it just looked off. Maybe it looks better? I don't know. Maybe 2%? It wasn't worth the time I spent tweaking it, probably. I added interior lighting into the center bunker to compensate. I also began research on third-person animations. I played with Mixamo for a bit, but the animations weren't as easy as dragging and dropping into my project, so... I'll probably just hand animate something for my game later. I streamlined the destination code for the high defense role and applied the code with some tweaks to the rest of the attacking slash defending roles. So now all of the roles except for the roamer are minimally functional. I'll get to you eventually. And for the final bug fix of this development sprint, the bots now look where they are going. That's not very gambler of you. You'd be a little gambler. Sorry, I don't have my gambling mindset. And that wraps up another six months on the project. I'm excited that I've made it this far, even though it wasn't always easy or even enjoyable. Sometimes hobbies are just like that. Honestly, I don't have any huge thought-provoking message this time around. It's just been business as usual. I also think I'm going to ditch the six-month video format going forward. I thought that me getting burnt out towards the end of the first sprint was a fluke, but no, it totally happened at the end of the sprint as well. I guess I'd say the biggest thing I learned this go-around was to take my time. For the first four months of this sprint, I was so focused on making the most progress so that I could make the most feature-packed update video. But going into every week with the mindset of get as much done as humanly possible wasn't really healthy for me. I plan on reworking how I set my goals in the future. I kind of forgot that the whole point was to have fun with it, something that I only remembered once I got burnt out. So yes, take your time. Whatever you're working on will be better for it, I promise. I'm gonna keep working on this project now. Thank you for watching.